This week, a one-liner exploit for X, the danger of searching for Chrome using Bing, exposing your Docker API. You can find sensitive data in the cloud, believe it or not. Exploiting users by embedding videos in Word documents, dead web apps, hacking BGP routes, a new DHCP vulnerability, and hacking your brain. Jason Wood from Paladin Security joins us for expert commentary to discuss the 12 days of malicious Python libraries that are found and removed from the Python repositories. Stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Hack Naked News. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show that brings you the security news each week. And despite popular belief, we do wear pants. It's Hack Naked News. Do you have a website, an external presence, employees, an office? Any of these things can be compromised and attacked. How are you defending your assets? Have you penetration tested your public assets? Start 2018 by taking a proactive approach to securing your vulnerable areas. Black Hills Information Security has been helping companies find their weaknesses since 2008. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com and see how they can help you sleep better at night. Welcome to Hack Naked News. This is episode 195 for October 30th, 2018. I'm your host, Boss Dorian, and we're broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island. If you're interested in quality over quantity and having meaningful conversations instead of just a badge scan, join us April 1st through the 3rd at Disney's Contemporary Resort for InfoSec World 2019, where you can connect and network with like-minded individuals in search of actionable information. Use the reg registration code even OS19-SECWEEK for 15% off. That's for a main conference pass or a world pass. It's going to be a lot of fun. InfoSec World is a great conference. Very much looking forward to it. In addition to looking forward to the security news for the week. An easy to exploit privilege escalation bug is present in OpenBSD and other big name operating systems. Several big name Linux and BSD operating systems are vulnerable to an exploit that gives users untrusted, uh, gives untrusted users powerful root privileges. I mean, we all know the power of root because we've all deleted something by accident or misconfigured something by accident as root. In any case, the critical flaw in the x.org server, which of course is the open source implementation of the x11 system that helps manage graphical displays, uh, which has been around for a really long time, probably, uh, well, maybe not before Jeff or, or Doug or certainly not Jack. Um, but it affects OpenBSD, which is widely considered to be one of the most secure operating systems. It also impacts some versions of Red Hat, Ubuntu, Debian, and CentOS distributions of Linux. Now, it's important to note that there are some limitations. With the exception of OpenBSD, which is supposed to be really secure, uh, most other operating systems running a vulnerable version of X require attackers to have an active console session. That means attackers must be using the physically attached keyboard and mouse, not a remote session. The requirement is, and I quote from the article, a huge limitation. Search for Chrome on Bing and you might get a nasty surprise. The Twitter user Gabriel Landau, who immediately upon firing up his brand new Windows 10 laptop, tried to download Google Chrome because basically no one wants to use Microsoft Edge. Uh, he was directed instead by Bing, the default search engine used by Windows 10's default Microsoft Edge browser, to a bogus website. Landau discovered that Bing was displaying a promoted search result to users searching for the phrase downloaded Chrome that linked to a non-official site, it's Google Online 2018 dot com don't go there because unless you want malware then go there if you don't want malware then don't go to that website um the instance was removed microsoft did respond uh to landau saying that uh it removed the offensive bing ad and banned the associated account uh, it is also pointed to a web page uh where low quality ads such as malvertising can be reported by users 
Exposed Docker API APIs used by attackers in creation of new containers that perform crypto jacking. Yes, this is in fact the same style of attack that, that bit us when we rushed an application out into the cloud and left the Docker API open and unauthenticated, not recommended because bad things will happen. Uh, as the article says, you know, this happens and it's easy not to be uh, vulnerable. It's easy to be vulnerable, rather. Uh, the oh, actually, it's easy not to be vulnerable because if you authenticate your Docker API or don't expose it to the internet, you're good. So it's not necessarily a vulnerability in terms of a bug. It's a misconfiguration. And we all know misconfiguration leads to compromise. Trend Micro uh, detected an attacker scanning explicitly for insecure and exposed Docker engine APIs and its utilization to deploy containers that download and execute a coin miner. Docker containers are redistributed on uh, and referred to as the Docker engine, right? So they live on the Docker engine uh, where they can be run in the background together with different containers deployed on the system. Essentially, they add a container into your Docker engine and then they can make use of that said system uh, to send distributed denial of service attacks or in this case, mine cryptocurrency using up all of your compute time on your cloud uh, instance. So don't do that. It's bad. 21% of all files in the cloud, speaking of badness in the cloud, contain sensitive data. Now, speaking of misconfiguration, McAfee has released its cloud application and risk report, which analyzed billions of events in anonymized customer production cloud use to assess the current state of cloud deployments and uncover risks. The report revealed that nearly a quarter of the data in the cloud can be categorized as sensitive, putting an organization at risk if stolen or leaked. The study found that while organizations aggressively use the public cloud to create new digital experiences for their customers, wow, that's so well put in the article. Uh, it's just written very well. Not often that we find that. Uh, the article goes on to say the average enterprise experiences more than 2,200 misconfiguration incidents per month in their infrastructure as a service platform as a or platform as a service instances researchers exploit a microsoft word flaw through embedded video researchers at an online breach and attack platform uh, vendor simulate found the vulnerability inside words online video feature which allow users to embed a reference to a remote video such as a youtube video directly into the document so that it can be played when it's opened now attackers can pull off the exploit by manually altering the reference to a remote video inside a docx file so that it points to malicious code inside the document instead of a video so watch out for that one um, dead web apps haunt 70% of the Financial Times top 500 firms. Researchers at High Tech Bridge, of course, make web protection type software, uh, use the Financial Times 500 list of leading companies and unearth a number of concerns when it comes to forgotten web applications. Uh, and they quote from the article, abandoned shadow and legacy applications undermine cybersecurity and compliance of the largest global companies despite growing spending. Uh, according to the uh, research report that they published, according to the report, also 70% of those Financial Times Global 500 firms have a portion of their website being sold on the black market. And an additional 92% of external web applications have exploitable security flaws or weaknesses. This speaks to uh, understanding your perimeter, doing asset management of all of your externally facing applications, uh, and getting a regular report. There's open source tools and, and vendors that, that can help you uh, with that. We shouldn't leave that exercise just for a yearly or even quarterly penetration test, which can typically unearth those vulnerabilities as well. No surprise that China's been hacking BGP routes. Um, of course, a Chinese state-owned telecommunications company has recently been found hijacking the vital internet backbone of Western countries, according to an academic paper published by researchers from the U.S. Naval War College and Tel Aviv University. We talked uh, at length about that on yesterday's Application Security Weekly episode. A nasty DHCP v6 packet can compromise your vulnerable Linux box. Uh, this is interesting. The flaw puts systemd-powered Linux clients, 
specifically those using systemd-networkd at risk of remote exploitation as a maliciously crafted DHCP v6 packet could exploit the vulnerability and arbitrarily even change parts of memory in vulnerable systems, leading, of course, to code execution. The vulnerability, which was made public this week, sits within the written-from-scratch DHCP v6 client of the open-source systemd management suite, which is built into various flavors of Linux. The DHCP client is activated automatically if IPv6 support is enabled and relevant packets arrive uh, for processing. Now, a rogue DHCP v6 server on the network or on the ISP network could transmit specially crafted router advertisement messages that wake up these clients and exploit the bug. This means you can go on a network, drop your keyboard, and then plug in a DHCP server and own multiple clients. And break your teleprompter, preventing you from reading the last story that's on the teleprompter that I don't have my backup notes up for yet. But if you hang in there and listen to some on hold music, do, 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 I can read the last story, which is really interesting because it's about hacking your brain. That's right. Um, the, the brain implants are a thing and not just on Black Mirror. Uh, the research paper states, um, and this was done in collaboration with Kaspersky and um, a University of Oxford Functional Neurosurgery Group. Um, and so brain implants are a thing. So here's what it says about brain implants. Hardware and software to underpin this exists uh, too. So deep brain stimulation or DBS is a neurosurgical procedure that involves implanting a medical device called a neurostimulator or implantable pulse generator, IPG, in the human body to send electrical impulses through implanted electrodes to specific targets in the brain for treatment of movement and neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, and like so many IoT devices, including the ones they could put in your brain, the Kaspersky Lab and University of Oxford's Functional Neurosurgery Group warn in a joint report that brain stim sim stimulation devices used to treat disorders like Parkinson's and OCD carry with them security vulnerabilities that would potentially allow attackers to manipulate the medical implants. Those flaws, including things like vulnerabilities in web apps used to administer the device and bugs in the tablet and smartphone apps doctors use to set up and record data from the implants, as well as poor practices like using default passwords or unencrypted data transmissions. I don't want a device with a default password in my brain. I don't think I really want a device in my brain, but that's neither here nor there because we're going to take a short break and come back with our expert commentary from Jason Wood. So stay tuned. Today's determined attackers easily bypass even the most advanced network defenses. Trying to ramp up staff to detect their back doors can cost thousands of dollars and take months, even years. With Active Countermeasures AI Hunter, we enable junior analysts to detect even the most advanced back doors in a matter of hours. Sign up for a demo and purchase our product today by visiting activecountermeasures.com forward slash HNN. Active Countermeasures, make every analyst a hunter. Welcome back, everyone, to Hack Naked News. We do have a webcast coming up with Signal Sciences on November 8th. That's right. You can go to Signal uh, now. You can go to securityweekly.com forward slash Signal Sciences. I mean, you can also go to signalsciences.com and, and get their awesome products. But we really want you to register for this webcast, securityweekly.com forward slash Signal Sciences. We'll talk about shifting testing to the extreme left or extreme right in your SDLC. It's going to be awesome. Larry Pesci, Zane Lackey, and myself. Lots of fun. Make sure you go register today. Securityweekly.com forward slash signal sciences. Jason Wood is here to tell us about his Python or the Python exploits in libraries. Jason, welcome. <laughs> hey, Paul, how's it going? <laughs> hey, it's going good. You know, I just, I dropped my keyboard earlier. It's, it's fine. It was kind of funny, I guess. And I had to sing to fill time. It was awesome. That's one way to, to rage quit a story, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, uh, this was a, an article published by ZDNet uh, that I that caught my eye, and you can put this down into another warning to watch out for typos when you're you're pulling down remote resources or code to to execute them. Um, like I said, in this case, we're talking about Python libraries that are part of the Python package index or PyPy. Uh, ZDNet reports that a software engineer who goes by the nick of Bertus found and reported 
12 different packages on PyPy that were malicious. Now these packages have already been removed, so you can't go pull them down and take a look at them. Um, but uh, Bertus found these, basically he was writing a tool. Uh, he'd heard uh, based on this, uh, an article he had read about malicious packages in repositories. So he's, he's working on a scanner to look for this type of stuff. And he ran into 12 different uh, packages he reported and had removed. Uh, the pattern that these packages follow is that basically they're typo squatting on the names. Um, and this might be an area where using interestingly spelled project names can bite us in the rear end. Um, for example, uh, four of the packages that were cited by ZDNet were slight misspellings of the Django project uh, for Python. Essentially what would happen is the creator or the attacker of the, the, the malicious package would pull down the original, modify it to perform whatever actions it is that they wanted to take place, and then create a new package with, and not strip out any of the functionality of the original library, and then re-upload it to the repository for use. Um, at this point, if somebody makes a mistake on their, their installation of the library and typos it, they're going to pull down this package. It's going to install successfully. And when they go to code against it, everything works as they expected because they attacker made some effort to make sure that things continued working. Uh, they were doing some modifications though, adding additional code, changing the setup, uh, .py script, uh, essentially to perform things like, um, leaking data, gaining persistence on the server in some ways. Uh, the notes I saw were making modifications to the .bashrc file, as well as in one case, opening up a reverse shell back to the attacker. Um, so I thought this was kind of interesting, not terribly new. I mean, we've had problems with typo squatting for years. and, and Yeah, this is seen... like Python library typo squatting, just kind of interesting take on typo squatting. And yeah. putting malicious uh, libraries, packages, or add-ons uh, into an ecosystem, which seems to be an increasing trend, which is very concerning for me. Yeah, I, and that was what I thought. I mean, how many times do you, are you looking at developing something, looking at a tutorial or whatnot, say you need to have this package installed, and you just type it out and run it, and you really don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about what it is you just installed. Um, it must be okay. It was written up. It's part of the repository. It's safe, right? And that's not necessarily a good choice. Um, from the attacker's perspective, this is kind of interesting because um, they're going to have to spend a fair bit of time creating a new package, making sure that they didn't break the mm. intended functionality. They put it out there and they wait. And they wait some more. <laughs> and eventually somebody typos this, pulls it down and right. installs it. But you know, at this point, they have no control or idea who the victim is, what industry are they working in. Um, what do they have, resources they have that might be of interest to the attacker? So it seems like it's not a very, obviously not a very targeted type of attack. Somebody's just going for access to systems on a, a kind of a spray and pray kind of model here. Um, but, you know, they could get lucky. You know, something like the Django framework, for example, somebody typos it, puts it into their uh, automated build process and rolls it out across a farm of mm -hmm. servers, or they might just get somebody's dev box. <clears throat> So, you know, perhaps their goals are generic, so it doesn't really matter. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, for example, spammer probably wouldn't care who they infected as long as they got somebody with an, uh, with an internet connection. So some thoughts I had about this is really just around the idea of, uh, Paul, like you said, you know, we've got this ecosystem here that, that is uh, accepted for use. You know, we, it's trusted. And... Um, we don't think very uh, much about what it is we're pulling down and installing. Uh, the repositories were very responsive in getting this removed as soon as Bertus reported them. They they got this stripped down. They abandoned uh, the you know an account that was or that was associated with it or accounts. Uh, but obviously they can just create a new one. Um, but to, if you're going to look at installing some of these libraries in your environments, I mean you really need to one make sure obviously we're getting the the name spelled correctly. Um, but, uh, you know, also take some, take a look at what this package is doing. I mean, do some evaluation of it, test it out, see if it's causing any, any unexpected changes to your system. 
you know, I shouldn't install a, a Python package and have it modify .bash or C, for example. Um, so deploy in a test environment where you've got some, some monitoring and check things out. Make sure you're updating your packages. This could help bubble up issues like this where if you did typo something, you try to do the update, the update's gonna fail because the package has been removed. Uh, so that should help alert you to things that are going on. And plus, you know, we kind of suck at updating these packages anyhow. Um, if you skip any of these due diligence steps, this is going to be something that could come back to bite you in the end. Um, so recommend you just be careful, pay attention to what you're doing. And this isn't limited to just Python. There have been reports of this happening on NPM and other repositories as well. Sweet. Uh, yeah, I think it's up to the ecosystem that uh, is providing these packages to do some level of due diligence, very similar to the you know, kind of Apple Store model. Um, there's a lot of things to look out for. Um, you know, malicious code in general, in, in just new applications or libraries, um, this type of squatting uh, kind of attack. Um, also, you know, kind of direct impersonation of other applications or libraries, right? Trying to be and look just like it so that it's not mm -hmm. so much a typo, but you're like, yeah, I want that one, but it's the wrong one. We see that in the, you know, the app stores all the time and with websites too. Um, so I think that, you know, we, in there, there are projects that are implementing a lot of code to check that. Uh, I know Docker was doing that uh, on containers, scanning them to make sure they weren't doing any, you know, calling specific functions or like you said, you know, modifying a dot bash file or something. Uh, so hopefully the protections get better. But I also like your suggestion of, you know, when you build it, deploy it in an environment uh, with some monitoring tools to see if it's doing anything that could be a security concern. Love it. And with that, that concludes the show. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. We'll see you next time on Hack Naked News. <laughs>